Hello, and thanks for taking time to rise up. I'm Don Ennis. In this half hour, Connecticut Governor Daniel Malloy, one-on-one, -on -one, talking about his two terms, looking back, answering your questions and mine. Also ahead, the race to replace Malloy heats up with a new entry, a candidate with West Hartford roots, who some say is the new Democratic frontrunner. And we'll have our monthly Rise Up report from our newest special correspondent, someone who's made headlines. You won't want to miss this. You know, it's good to be back with you after many months away. Since our last episode, a lot's happened. I found a job right here in West Hartford. It was great, but it only lasted two months. You see, I came out as transgender on a Friday, and I got fired on a Sunday. The rest of that story is something I'll leave up to the lawyers. But it's not all bad news. I just won a huge victory from the state health insurance company, Husky, and I told you about that last fall. Bureaucrats were blocking me from seeing a surgeon in New York City, one who operates on women like me under state budgets. You know, they, they pay for it, which is a great, great thing. But they were forcing me to see a surgeon here in Connecticut, the only one that is contracted with the state. He's the one who told me that I'd have to switch my sexual orientation so I could please a man. Yeah, not happening. Last but not least, I'm going to share with you a treat worth the wait. We'll enjoy a snippet from the wonderful production of When You Wish Upon a Spiel, put on by the Not Ready for Purim players at Congregation Beth Israel, a cast that includes my children, Sean, Sophie, and Liam. I'm so very proud. But first, Governor Daniel Malloy is here with us in our studio to look back at where he's taken Connecticut and talk about how he rose up from mayor of Stanford to lead our state for two terms. Welcome, Governor. Yeah, it's nice to be with you, Don. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, we do too. And let's just start with, what's your fondest memory of the last two terms? Oh, I have a lot of uh, fond memories. Uh, I, I think most recently I was able to uh, uh, bring my uh, uh, granddaughter, my only grandchild, up to the, into the uh, house of the uh, you know, the state house, that was fun. I, I, you know, I go back to year one when we uh, passed transgender uh, uh, protections that uh, had failed to, to be adopted previously in Connecticut. Uh, I think of the times that the uh, President Obama was here and that Connecticut was the first state to formally raise uh, the minimum wage to $10.10. Uh, paid sick leave we did in year one um, as well. I mean, there's some amazing accomplishments um, that kind of get drowned out because we've had to struggle with a, a tough economy and quite frankly my predecessors uh, not having done their job as far as funding long-term obligations but we really have also moved the state forward in some amazing ways you know um, Scott McLean at Quinnipiac University was quoted in the Connecticut Post recently as saying the situation in our state is such that being the governor of Connecticut is not a real great job right now. Do you agree with him? Well, it's been a great job in the sense that you, 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 know, you have to work really hard, and I like that, and you, you got to keep moving forward. Um, but, but the reality uh, of our uh, economic situation and, and the fact that uh, uh, the legislature and prior governors were more than happy to spend, they just weren't happy to pay for. Uh, and that uh, unfortunately fell upon me to straighten out and it's, uh, it's hard to explain to people who've gotten used to only spending and, and not paying. Here's a question that was asked at a recent Democratic Forum of the people who want to succeed you. What is your most unpopular act? What did you do that was most unpopular and let's say during your last two terms? Um, tell the truth. I mean, I, I think uh, uh, people would rather be lied to uh, than to be told the hard truth about where they are and the sacrifices that are required to uh, uh, put the place in, in good order again. Um, and, you know, you see that in statements that that people, Democrats and Republicans running for, for governor will, will talk about, that there's, they pretend that there's some magic trick that's going to uh, roll back all of the difficulties that we brought upon ourselves. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think telling the truth uh, day in and day out is difficult. And you know, listen, you, 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 you can see our own society is, is deciding what, what a definition of truth is, right? We have, a, we have a president who talks about fake news when it's real news and makes up stuff um, and, and speaks as a, of it as if it's the truth. Well, that's, that's entered into Connecticut politics to some extent. 
Senator Patrick, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, another Irish person like ourselves, once said, you're entitled to your own opinion, you're not entitled to your own set of facts. Yeah, but I think uh, we live in a society where people uh, are deciding that, that, that they get to decide what facts are and, and that scientific evidence with respect to climate change can be ignored because uh, it flies in the face of what I want to burn to generate energy. Um, uh, that, uh, that, that our society has not done well by the middle class at a time that it's made the rich uh, as rich as they were uh, in the Gilded Age uh, and, and that the separation of wealth and poverty is probably even greater. Uh, now, we do have a safety net that didn't ex exist in the Gilded Age, um, uh, but if you look at the discrepancy between uh, the middle class and, and the top one, two, or three percent, it really is quite extraordinary in our country. I watched a report in which you uh, talked about how Connecticut is helping uh, folks who were displaced by Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. And Hartford has a huge Puerto Rican population. Why did you rise up in that case? Because so many people would say Connecticut can barely pay its own bills and take care of its own poor. Well, I mean, I, I think, I think that, that we actually do a, a better job than most states of taking care of our own poor, quite frankly, uh, uh, and that's something that we've insisted on. Uh, the reality is these are citizens. They get to choose where they're going to go. It's not unusual that people follow their other relatives uh, to a state. Uh, that's what happened with, with uh, Irish immigration and Italian immigration and Polish immigration and German immigration. Uh, here we're talking about immigration from an American island to an American state. But, you know, Florida, New York, and New Jersey, and Massachusetts uh, are all going to get a, a big part of that population. Uh, and it's going to permanently relocate. And so now I think the real question is, is not do we open our doors, but how do we maximize this opportunity to take a new set of workers, a new set of views, uh, and ingrain them in our society uh, and, uh, and bring them, if they're not already in the middle class, bring them into the middle class as quickly as possible. Have you had trouble getting federal funding to support that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, the, uh, the, 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 you know, there is, we do operate in a society where, where government draws um, uh, circles around people. I mean, I think that we have treated uh, displaced people from uh, from Florida or from Dal or from uh, uh, Texas a lot better than we've treated the folks from the Commonwealth of, of Puerto Rico, even even though all of those folks are American citizens. Uh, I think Puerto Rico is a little more difficult because it's an island. We, let's be honest, it's, it's more difficult getting things there and getting them uh, uh, moved around the island. But we wouldn't tolerate um, uh, uh, treating a non-Hispanic American population the way that we've tolerated our federal government's treatment of Puerto Rico. This show is about activism. How have you in your life, before governor, as mayor, or just as a private citizen, have, how have you met the challenge to rise up to do something that makes a difference? Well, you know, I think it starts with my mother. Uh, we were, uh, uh, you know, I come from a large family and everyone was told that they had a responsibility to leave the world a better place for their having lived in it. Um, uh, that combined with having to overcome some pretty uh, tough physical and uh, uh, intellectual challenges, specifically dyslexia and other processing disorders, um, I think gave me a, a, a desire to get things done. Um, the patience, uh, believe it or not, and I'm not a terribly patient person, but to, to, to stay at it to get things done um, uh, and a focus. Dyslexia is something that a lot of people have no idea how to uh, describe it. What was your, uh, for lack of a better word, trick? How did you overcome it? You know, I, I think that uh, development of oral communication skills was important. I think uh, my mother's and my father's decision to concentrate on strengths as opposed to weaknesses was, was very important. But, you know, when I went away to college, I was still listening to books for, uh, recorded for the blind, not because I couldn't read, but I couldn't but I read so slowly uh, that it was actually faster to, to hear someone read it. And that's a, that's a slow process. Um, uh, you know, it's affected me in, um, uh, in, in other processing. Uh, uh, written language is very difficult as opposed to oral language. So dictation is a lot easier than sitting down and putting a uh, pen to paper. I also noticed that because it puts you in a um, uh, better frame to understand the disabled or the marginalized, you've translated that in your own um, 
terms. You've mentioned at the beginning that Connecticut uh, put out gender identity protections, not just for uh, everyday folks, but for the military. Mm -hmm. um, you signed a law that banned conversion therapy. Is LGBT and, and also funding for Planned Parenthood, as you mentioned in your state of the state, um, is that something that you see as your legacy? I hope so. I think I hope it's part of the le legacy. Um, you know, I think uh, as building, you know, and funding twenty-two thousand new um, units of housing, um, much of that uh, set aside as affordable, uh, or making sure that we ended homelessness for veterans in the state. One of only uh, three states to actually have done that. That doesn't mean that veterans won't choose to be homeless, but that we can actually move people who become homeless into permanent housing relatively quickly. I mean, I, I think that, that uh, it's, it's one of those ways you leave the world a better place for you having lived in it. Um, and I, I think that, that we're constantly looking for those opportunities. I think on the, on, on, uh, the gender side, uh, you know, our society uh, has for thousands of years looked at, at how you divide people um, as opposed to how do you bring them together? How do you have, how, how do you uh, uh, isolate people as opposed to how do you incorporate people? And so I think uh, in a relatively short period of time, uh, particularly here in the United States, we've made a lot of progress on those issues. Um, uh, you know, we were one of the first states to uh, allow for gay marriage. Uh, uh, that was uh, started with civil unions. The court said, well, if you have unions, then you have to identify it as marriage, which I totally agree with. Um, you know, we should be proud of our history in Connecticut of standing up for, for folks. Uh, and that was some of the things that I wanted to talk about in my State of the State Address, which I call Connecticut Fairness. We've led that struggle throughout our uh, national, our participation in our uh, national uh, development. Um, and the United States is a better state, be, uh, a, a better federation because of the contributions of people from Connecticut. And I don't want to see that stop. I do notice, though, that, and I'm sure you have too, the pendulum has swung not just from facts and opinions, but to bitter division, more so than ever. And we thought it was bad under Obama. Yeah. <laughs> what is the advice you could give to viewers about what they can do to end the political debates, the, the, the backbiting? Because right now, I would say the hardest part about engaging with people who have different opinions is not being able to reach consensus. It doesn't seem to exist anymore. Well, it, it, it certainly is harder. Um, I think that, well, let's, let's talk about guns for a second. 97% of Americans want universal background checks. So why don't we have it? Right? So, so it's, it's not the American people who don't want consensus, it's their leaders who don't want consensus. And the NRA. Well, you know, and, and, and the NRA and the people they buy, right? You know, they, they invested 30, Pockets, yeah. $30 million in the president's campaign and, and spent a lot of money on the, on the Senate. And if uh, I can interrupt, in Connecticut, there isn't one representative who's taken money from uh, the NRA on the Democratic side. Right, right. No, I, I understand that. Um, but, I, but I, again, I think Americans have developed a consensus. Their leadership is, is behind. But I think we also live in very strange times. I mean, when the, when the president uses, uh, uh, pretends that facts are fake and, and fake things that he makes up in his head are true, um, and uh, it's okay for him to abuse people, but nobody else should, um, uh, you know, that's not exactly leadership by example. I put out a notice on Facebook for our viewers to ask them if they had any questions for you. One was just rude. Italia Johnson said, why don't you just bow out now and take early retirement? I think that's a rude question, but I'm going to ask you if you want to answer well, it. Well, they didn't offer it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, is that Italia? Italia uh, Johnson. You know, I, I think that, um, you know, I, 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 listen, uh, when you've had the opportunity to walk in my shoes, then, then um, uh, I'll welcome your advice. <laughs> uh, a man who's a CPA, William Brigenti, asked, why do you favor what he labeled regressive taxes over progressive taxes? He talked about um, the state employee bargaining agent coalitions, the CBAC deal. Why did you support that? Um, because we have renegotiated that contract on two separate occasions, saving the state on a long-term basis tens of billions of dollars um, after Republican governors gave away the House um, and refused to fund it. That's an I mean, I, I, you know, you're a CPA, wake up. <laughs> you know, that's what I would say. And lastly, Frank DePino wants to know how much, if any, taxpayer dollars are paid back to the state from the companies receiving funds from your five-point plan of 2011. He named a couple of companies, Cigna, ESPN, 
NBC. So, yeah, so all of those transactions are valued out. I mean, this is something that is probably misunderstood. So what, when you value them out to make sure that they will, that you will recover the money back that you're investing, you look at the size, for instance, of a, of a physical improvement, um, and you and you look at the tax value of that um, on the tax rolls for for the municipality that that sees it, uh, for the goods and services sold to bring that about. But most particularly, what you're valuing is the salaries uh, and therefore the tax income on the income tax side of the additional employees that, that are being brought to uh, uh, to the state. So let's uh, uh, we'll look at uh, um, NBC. NBC um, uh, does all of their sports broadcasting through Stamford, Connecticut. There are about a thousand jobs there now. There were, that, that moved from New York State uh, and from Philadelphia into Connecticut. Those are very well pay paid employees. Uh, they're paying income tax, they're paying property taxes on the houses that, 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 they've, uh, that they live in and, and the like. Uh, and there are formulas that measure all of that out. Um, and uh, it pays for itself. Uh, that's why states do it. And like, in a perfect world, we wouldn't have to compete against other states, right? And no, nobody would be offering these kinds of, uh, of incentives. But, but, but they do. I mean, you know, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, uh, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts. We're all we're all uh, uh, competing in many in many ways for the same jobs because we're all good at a at a particular set of things. So, for instance, let me let me talk about Pratt and Whitney. Okay. We've gotten Pratt and Whitney to make major, um, uh, 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 you know, a billion dollars worth of investment, a billion dollars, several billion dollars, multiple billion dollars of investment in um, uh, research in Connecticut. That's paying dividends for the taxes that show up by the people who are employed in that. If those jobs were to move to a place like Florida, then we would we would lose not only the jobs that were already here, but the jobs that, that those agreements bring about um, to be to uh, uh, to enlarge their workforce, which they're doing in Connecticut. Or uh, Lockheed now owns Sikorsky. We competed head to head uh, with Florida um, for the the build out of the new. Uh, heavy lift helicopter. So we'll have two lines in, in, uh, down in uh, Shelton as opposed to just one line. Um, that brings, uh, will bring thousands of jobs um, and those people will pay income tax and property tax and, and other things. So that's the competition. The competition is for good paying jobs um, and we've won when it comes to electric boat and we've won when it comes to United Technologies and we've won when it comes to Sikorsky and we've won when it comes to NBC uh, uh, Sports and there are many other ways that we've one, and that's how you value it. Now, in our last minute, because we're knowing that you have a very busy schedule, the people who are in West Hartford don't feel like winners. They feel as if they lost. They feel as if this is a rich community that has had to give more than its fair share. How do you explain that to our West Hartford residents and viewers about how they had to sacrifice and why to make the budget balance? Well, again, I think that, that, that uh, the income that people would like to see grow hasn't grown. I mean, we, we've, we've been in slower growth than people are used to. Um, and I think uh, we made some bad decisions in 2008 um, and 2009 and well before that with respect to not the state not paying its long-term obligations. I didn't create these obligations. In fact, I've made them substantially smaller. Um, uh, but the legislature with uh, bad leadership, quite frankly, from a string of, of governors, pretended um, that these obligations weren't piling up. And in point of fact, when John Rowland was, was governor, he entered into this CBAC arrangement with, with employees, promised them the moon, um, uh, and also got an agreement that he wouldn't have to fund it. It would only have to be funded, in essence, in the future. Um, you know, that's... Uh, uh, well, I, that's uh, voodoo uh, math, I guess. <laughs> what is that, voodoo economics? Yeah. Is that from our history books? Yes. Um, any chance you might be able to uh, tell us who you're voting for this uh, I know, August? I, 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 no, I don't. I don't I, <laughs> only because I don't know who I'm voting for. I don't know what the field is. I don't know who will be on the ballot um, uh, in August or, or in no, November. Well, but what I will tell you is uh, that this will be a, be a very competitive race between Democrats and Republicans. I was the first Democrat elected in 24 years, um, uh, and the only one, only governor to actually straighten out on a long-term basis the, the, the finances 
of the state so that we're honoring our long-term commitments. Uh, and I hope whoever becomes governor doesn't play the same games that my predecessors played by effectively lying to people. Well, thank you, Governor. You're going to recognize the name of the newest candidate to throw his hat into the ring to succeed you. It's your former commissioner of consumer protection and our town's former mayor, Jonathan Harris, and we're going to show a little clip of that. Thanks again for coming by. Thank you. When something is wrong, you stand up and you fight to fix it. You treat everyone, everyone with dignity and respect. Yeah. yeah. With dozens of supporters cheering him on, Harris invoked the Hebrew words tikkun olam, meaning to repair the world, as his motivation for running. Harris is 53. He led the redevelopment of Blueback Square and was head of the Democratic Party during Governor Malloy's 2014 bid for re-election. Republican critics have come out swinging for Harris because of $325,000 the party paid the State Election Enforcement Commission in 2016. That followed accusations that money had been illegally funneled from state contractors to an account to support Malloy's campaign. Harris maintains payments were fully investigated and no wrongdoing has ever been found. We'll look more closely at the race for governor as we close in on the state primary in August. Now time for the Rise Up report from this month's special correspondent. Tell us how you're rising up. Hi, I'm Sarah McBride, National Press Secretary at the Human Rights Campaign and the author of Tomorrow Will Be Different, Love, Loss, and the Fight for Trans Equality. Sarah, thank you very much for joining us on Rise Up. Very briefly, because I know you have so many people who want to talk to you, and I'm very grateful for finally getting to meet you. It's an honor. Would you tell our viewers, which is a show about rising up, about getting involved, how you decided to get involved? What was it that made you decide, even before you decided, I have to come out as me, you wanted to be an activist, you wanted to be an advocate. What was it that prompted you to think that? Well, you know, I always read history and I always loved politics as a young kid and I began to, to find myself being drawn to the battles for equal rights and human rights throughout our history and understanding that there was something that was different about me and even if I couldn't accept that truth about myself, that politics was potentially the means for fixing society for other people, for making a little bit more space for other people to live their life more fully. And to me, I thought if, if I could do that for others, then maybe I could stay in the closet and it would be okay for me. And it became clear eventually that that advocacy and that work only highlighted my own internal struggle even more. And it was through that advocacy that I was able to gain the courage and the confidence to finally come out as myself. Most important question I have is not for our LGBT viewers or readers, but what is your message to the readers who are either questioning or just curious about the LGBT movement, about you? What is in your book that will help them understand this? Well, I think stories are incredibly powerful in making change because stories can allow us to see that behind this national conversation on transgender rights are real people who hurt when we're mocked, who hurt when we're discriminated against, and who just want to be treated with dignity and fairness. And my hope in writing this book, and my hope that readers will take the, the takeaway they'll, they'll, they'll have from this book, is that transgender people are people who love and laugh, hope and dream, fear and cry just like everyone else. And I truly believe that if you can humanize an issue, if you can make it no longer abstract, if you can cut through the caricatures and the myths, you can reach people, and that will eventually not just change hearts and minds, but allow us to move equality forward. Tell everyone where you can get the book. You can visit sarahmcbride.com, and you can order it online through that website at uh, Amazon, Indie Books, Barnes & Noble, and also wherever books are sold. Thanks, and thank you for watching. I'm Don Ennis. Any questions or are you looking for information about the folks on our show, go to this website, lifeafterdawn.com. You'll also find previous episodes. We'd love for you to watch us on YouTube, and if you are, thank you. Like, share, and subscribe. We leave you with a performance from this year's Purim Spiel at Congregation Beth Israel. When You Wish Upon a Spiel, starring my daughter Sophie as Queen Esther and her brothers Sean and Liam in supporting roles. The entire cast was amazing, but of course, I'm especially proud of my children, who always remember to, come on, rise up.